All right. Uh, we're live. We're here with uh, Glenn Miller, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Pro Tem. Of and of course, Pastor Nate Conant and, uh, and your servant, Raul Avila. We're here to uh, discuss some important topics that, uh, that as, as you know, this is our fourth, uh, our fourth, our fourth episode and really exciting things, huh, Pastor? For we're sure. We're discussing all the things that, are, that we're going to have in the future and um, talking about real um, issues that have to do with uh, that, 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 our, that our daughters and, and mm -hmm. our kids are going to go through throughout the years and uh, here in California or anywhere in the U.S. And it's important for us to discuss this because um, if, if not us, then who, yeah. right? If not now, then when? And, uh, and, and and create some awareness of you know of of, uh, of maybe get a d different perspective and today uh, Pastor Nate why don't you uh, yeah, introduce so mm -hmm. Glenn Miller is a friend of mine and um, he's certainly a local politician so we are all in the Coachella Valley Southern California um, Glenn Miller's in, been involved with politics for many years mayor of Indio um, currently you're actually on Kiln Calvert's how would you define your role there, Glenn? I'm his uh, Coachella Valley representative. There we go. And so um, Ken Calvert is the congressman for, I think it's District, is it 41? For, District 41, 41 yes. District 41, and represents this area of Southern California in Washington, D.C., a fantastic congressman who, in, you know, opinions might vary on this, but who's led very well and um, done a great job. And so today we have Glenn with us. Um, today's topic is going to be a good deal about politics. Um, Sometimes I don't know if we listen well enough when it comes to politics, and I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of room for us to grow. But Glenn, we'll jump right in with you and ask you for maybe a first question. How long have you been in politics? Well, technically, I've been in 23 years. I've been on the council, going on my 16th year now. I um, got involved with uh, the city council of the city of Indio when I didn't really like 100% of what was going on. And my father always told me when I first uh, was growing up to basically either do something about it or get it out of the way. But, you know, I didn't like what was going on. And I said to myself, let's see if I can help. And I started to join the city council after I was on the planning commission for seven years. So I got my feet wet and then jumped in and, and I've been on the council ever since. Been mayor three times and very blessed to be able to uh, work with a lot of the other cities and the county here out in the Coachella Valley. So 23 years of being involved. I know you're on other boards and other committees. I know you're very involved. And I will say for the city of Indio, it's certainly probably one of the, I mean, there's cities out here in the Coachella Valley that are doing very good, but Indio has probably grown exponentially more in a lot of different ways, both in population and in like economics, probably over many cities, even in this valley. Yeah, we, we've done very well. The Coachella mm -hmm. Valley as a whole has done very well. Yeah. Um, we speak and work as one, and that's mm -hmm. what makes this Coachella Valley so different. The city of Indio, that's who I represent. That's who my allegiance is in the Coachella Valley. But the stronger the Coachella Valley is, the stronger Indio is. So I always look mm -hmm. at it as a regional effect. Mm. But Indio is the largest city. It's the oldest city. Um, when I first got into city council, we had a $3 million deficit in our reserves. Today, we enjoy over a $20 million uh, reserve plus nice. a, a balanced budget. We don't spend anything we can't uh, pay for. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, building the downtown area. We have a new police campus, new uh, fire campus getting ready to get open up. The library just got knocked down. We're going to build a new city hall, new library for our community. And we're investing over $20 million in our streets and improvements wow. for our properties that, that uh, enter into the city. So you're going to see new bridges. You're going to see uh, roads paved. You're going to see new landscape, and you see the signs everywhere. We're investing the money that our residents gave us back into them. We're sewing back in them in so many ways. And, and one of the other things that we really are pushing right now is parks. Hmm. We are investing in new soccer parks and parks as a whole, upgrading, uh, highlighting uh, aspects where we're going to get the kids back out and their families back out into the parks, out in the open, not only exercising, but give a sense of community. Very nice. That's awesome. Um, so what what did you where where do you come from like are you from the coachella valley or what's what's your background in yeah at your younger years well i, I, I grew up in a combination of Ivan chino and then i came out and uh, to build the golf resort in wells for the city of indian wells and just fell in love with the desert um i just really enjoyed the people i enjoyed the, the slower pace of life i enjoyed the camaraderie and, and how everybody basically it was a small town feel um 
with a lot of opportunity and just uh, was uh, encompassed by everything that was here. We had such beauty, and, and with the, uh, the heat, it was a little bit of a challenge <laughs> from where I came from, but it just grew on me, and it was really the people. So I raised my family here. I have three amazing kids, um, two grandkids, and I've been here a little less than 40 years right now. So a good portion of my life has been here, and I just can't think of anywhere else but the Coachella Valley. So what I know you mentioned um, how you got involved with politics, but did you, what was your point of view and why did you feel compelled to be in politics? Because I, I look at people that are in politics and I'm, and I'm thinking they, you know, they want to make a change, but then maybe they start in, they start out with a good heart. Good intentions. But then good intentions, but mm -hmm. then they get in the crazy beast of politics and some somehow something happens that mm -hmm. they get corrupt or something like that. Um but I mean this is this is my point of view because I'm not in politics, right? But but it's but it's uh but I'm not I'm not trying to say that that's you. I'm, no, no, what I'm no, saying I, I is get it. what how does that work in terms of how did you start and the passion of that? Well my father and my grandfather raised me to to give back to the community, no matter what it was. Once you were able to grow your family and my kids all got older, I decided to get more engaged with the community as a whole. With that led me to the city. So I was in a rotary club. I sat on the Boys and Girls Club board. I sat on the Desert Art Board, the ABC Recovery Board. I did it because I wanted to give back to my community. Mm -hmm. The ultimate uh, time frame that I looked at was after my kids grew up. So I was able to spend more time after work instead of working and doing stuff with them. They were off in college and doing their other things. I was able to spend time giving back to my community, um, Rotary Club of Indio. And what it was is civic service that was we were giving back. And I saw how much it made a, an effect on our community. And when the Planning Commission and the City Council came up, I thought, why, why would I want to do that? I'm able to be engaged with our city, with the actual people, without having any of the hassles of doing this. But normally what happens is, and mine was a little different, is people get engaged because they got a certain issue. Mm. They don't like the roads. They don't like the parks. They don't like um, the police department. Whatever it is that is their passion, not enough fire. Um, you know, there's not enough um, opportunities, businesses. And that's usually what happens. And then what happens after that's taken care of or you realize you can't do it because it's out of our purview, um, they go into other stuff. And, and I don't want to say nobody ever gets corrupt. Don't, don't get me wrong with that. But everybody goes in there with a good heart. I, yeah. Everybody that is out here in the Coachella Valley, I can speak for, are good public servants. They mm -hmm. want to help their community. We all agree in different ways. We all think differently. But in the end, they care about their city. They care about their county. They care about the community. So... With me, it was just, it was that opportunity to give back. And then I saw the difference that I could make. I, I wanted to be able to change what I saw and work with others to make things better. Mm -hmm. A lot of it comes with my faith. A lot mm -hmm. of it comes with the people I know. Um, because it's not me. It's, it's everybody. It's, it's, I don't run the city. I work for the city. I work for the residents. And that's where people got to go back to look at we are public servants of the man up above mm -hmm. first, and then after that, our residents. So working with the guidelines that we have to listen to our residents, our businesses, and our community, how can we make your life mm -hmm. better? Mm -hmm. And then that's setting policies in place to work with our city manager, work with our staff, work with those in the business community that really want to make change and work with them. And, and that's what I saw, and that's what I grasped onto. Was, uh, I didn't like mm -hmm. what was going on. I had an opportunity to be the planning commission. Jackie Bethel, who was the mayor at the time, longtime resident here of the Coachella Valley, uh, gave me that opportunity. And then from there, it just it kind of grew. You know. So I, in a way, this is kind of like a public service. This, this is certainly. one way to get involved by doing this podcast. So mm -hmm. in a way, we are yeah. public you know, servants. Let me say this to Glenn, too. Having known him and watched him the last few years, there's very few people that are more available and loves the Coachella Valley more than he does. Like, literally, I've watched him knock on strangers' doors. They have a problem, and he gives them his phone number, and he asks how it can be a help to the problem. And I think that idea, as you said, like almost like a servant's heart, servant mm -hmm. leadership, a public servant is truly what you've lived out. And if there's one thing, I, like when people ask, what's he think about this, that, or the other, to me, although those issues can be important, the fact of who, you're, who you are and what your heart is in terms of serving the community, it shows through. And you have done, in my opinion, 
I don't know, I'm inspired by who you are and how you've served the community. And I do think you've made things better. I think your philosophy of serving, like mm-hmm. versus like I'm here to be whatever, truly is, I think is an example of Christ, but it's truly an example that we need in those who serve in any capacity within cities. And so Glenn, we appreciate you for doing that for us. You made uh, Valley better. Uh, and I think that, and I thank you for that, but there's a lot of good servants out here. They might do it in a different way. I, I like to get 100% engaged. I like to be involved with the community. So it's a little different for me, but everybody has their own style. Mm-hmm. But honestly, we have a really good uh, group of uh, city council members, elected officials from boards and everything else. So we're very blessed in that way. That's neat. Cool. Okay, so um, so when you, so when, where, because I'm not, I'm, the way I look at it, Glenn is if it's going to happen, I'm not going to wait for the White House to make something happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do do what I can do to control my house and not wait for the White House. And in many ways, we've lo- I've lost a lot of trust or confidence in politicians because, you know, and, and most of it probably is propaganda. And, and that's why I don't even watch the news. So. Just out of curiosity, where, at what level does it start going, you know, going bad in politics? Maybe, maybe in Washington, D.C., or because I look at different people and, and I don't know, you know, like, I, I think the higher you I'm get curious. up, my personal opinion, mm-hmm. the higher you get up, the more the Kool Aid you drink. I mean, okay. we always talk about it. You hear that on TV, <laughs> you hear it on everything else. There are so many good elected leaders at the local level. That's where the rubber meets the road, to be honest with you. I can't do anything about Washington, D.C. other than vote. I can't do anything about Sacramento other than vote. Mm -hmm. But when you have a district of 750,000 people, um, my voice will help to make sure that whoever I think that could do the best job will um, be able to voice that, hopefully, for them so that I can highlight what they've done and why they would be the best choice. But I'm only one vote. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot where people go wrong. Uh, The the local elected officials, you need to keep those in mind. And we don't hold as many people responsible for the votes. I'm not saying everybody's going to vote. There's there's probably three or four votes I would actually take back if I could in hindsight. That's if I knew it all, then I'd pick the six lottery numbers. I'd be on my way. (laughs) But, Mm -hmm. you know, um, most of it is to get up. We, We say that all the time at the local level. Uh, you get a council member, you get somebody that's at one of the cities, they're running for state office or the county and that, and they're not as held responsible to the people actually in their district. So they go up to Sacramento three quarters of the time and they can hide and buy it and Kool-Aid and you're, and you're talking about local controls, one of the big ones. Leave us alone. Let our cities decide with our mm-hmm. residents what's in our best interest. Yes, you have to have basic stuff but like if we want two-story buildings well two-story if we want this kind of development we can develop development we're not all the same it's not a cookie cutter mm-hmm. but when you get up to sacramento it's like they forget the things they were fighting for Grassroots. at the local level mm-hmm. now aren't important and, and you always go back and say well gosh you were one of us i mean you were here at the local level fighting for your city and now you're up there fighting against us what made you change mm-hmm. that you no longer are worried about what our interests are when you were there at the ground level and you saw what the impact of either Sacramento mm-hmm. or Washington does to us in certain ways? And why would you be a part of that? And I think as you get up higher and higher, the influence, the power, the money, all this mm-hmm. stuff that goes through. I mean, these, some of these Congress races that we're looking at here just in the Kitchener Valley, you're talking – Millions. Eight, ten, fifteen million dollars mm-hmm. for a hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar job. It's not the money that goes to spend. It's the money to buy the power for the vote, and the and and what they influence they do because it's just one person. It's just crazy to me. So I think the higher you get up, the more you have other issues. But at the same time, they're bigger issues. Mm-hmm. The things that they deal yeah. with don't have to do the same thing as you at the state level. It's you Makes know sense. it's it's immigration it's in in federal level it's immigration it's housing it's that we fight it at the little level but we don't have the money to make the difference it's all them up there so they they have a lot more issues they have to worry about Hmm. so so just to say something and i I, you can make clarification to this at the city level you've said this before that you don't run on a party like basis in other Mm -hmm. words you're not identified by a party correct Mm -hmm. right and then so as you go higher and higher certainly the party begins to dictate a bit more of what you do. In other words, you have to move collectively with this big group. Absolutely. And, and 
it's part of that way. That's why from the county supervisor down, school boards, city council members, rec districts, we're nonpartisan. And right. when we look at it, we don't. We have really honestly, if you saw the city of Indio as the Indio council themselves, they all know where we stand. Mm -hmm. But when we're up on the dais, you never see it. We don't, it's not in our purview. We might have our personal opinions, uh, but politics doesn't come into mm -hmm. our thing very often. It's usually what's in the best interest of our residents. How can we come to a consensus to make their life better? How do we invest this money? How do we invest this time, this resources to make sure their life's better? Because in the long run, when you're walking through the grocery store, you're going to see the people that you affect, and mm -hmm. they're going to see you. Mm -hmm. So it's a big difference in what we do. Um, and unfortunately, as you get up higher and higher, you have to appease more people. And you just got to be true to yourself. I think where most people go wrong is in two ways. One, they get higher in power and they get high on the power. And it's, it could, sometimes it's difficult. Mm -hmm. The second part of it is when you get up there and you're looking at things around you, your surroundings change. You're not with those base of people that you see on a daily basis. You're not at your church. You're not at your grocery store. You're not at your kid's school. You're not at this. You're hearing from people that have a as nurse for the whole state, the whole region, instead of where you belong is which who you represent as the people there. And so you've got to vote what's in the best interest. You can't vote what's popular. And I think a lot of people could start to go was, how can I split the, this right between the middle so that I don't make anybody mad? No, you got to make your choice. You got to pick it and you got to stick to it. And if you don't, then you are probably in the wrong business. Well said, let me ask you this. So as far as maybe Indio, even Coachella Valley, what do you see as some of the major problems that we have right now? Oh, it goes high and high and far. I mean, we're always looking to get better. Um, transportation, you know, the bus system. I'm, I'm on the bus sign board. I was the chairman for three terms already. And when you look at it, it's a great system. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough money. There's not enough ridership. There's not enough time. And you couldn't throw enough money at it in our valley to make it better. Homelessness, out of control. For sure. Um, mental health is a the big part of it. And substance I think a lot abuse. Of, yeah, exactly. Substance abuse is a, probably the biggest factor of homelessness, right? And mental health, mm -hmm. by far. When they close down the mental health facilities, they basically put all these people on the street. Mm. And it's migrated to more to families and other people, which breaks my heart because of the price of housing. And, and I don't think a city, and this is when you look at homelessness, the city's not big enough and strong enough. The county doesn't probably even have enough money. No. It comes down to the state because the amount of money you have to throw at the issue because it's so large is only at a state or federal level and, and state and fed money comes through and then, and then what happens though and, and this is where they kind of lose me on the like, let's issue the homeless issue because we talked about it it's it's a statewide countrywide issue it is it affects but everybody good, good weather places life. are worse yes <laughs> we have and, good weather here in california is, yes. is by far the worst we, yes. we kind of resonate with trying to help them in certain ways and we've created our own issue but when you look at the issues at hand no matter how many people you're there, you can't, there's not enough funding in the city of India to help them. There's not enough to get these people off the street. And people don't see it as a problem that's theirs in terms of how it really affects their overall life. But it's just going to get worse and worse it has. and worse. And, and then the damage, like, like even for the church, I'd speak to this. During the summer, a homeless person kept messing with our irrigation. We lost four thousand dollars worth of plants and trees. Mm. We're putting up fences because they're starting fires next to the building and almost catching the building on fire. And it's thousands of dollars of damage. And I know, as a church, we want to help that. But homelessness is become a really, really big issue here in the Coachella Valley. And it'll continue to be a big issue. It'll continue until we put the money in the right places, which is mental health facilities, substance abuse, and yeah. put the laws in place to not punish them to help them for sure i would rather pay five thousand dollars a month to put that person into a facility to give them the proper care the proper food the proper oversight to hopefully get them better than i would to give them three thousand dollars to sit out on the street somewhere and and not get the help because it's not going to go away and i think that's what's happening is people are burying their heads in the sand thinking this is going to go away as a project but it's affecting us all as it and you can't do it as an individual it has to come from the top and they really have to put the rules in, in place and then put the laws in place and follow them. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's what a lot of the issues come is that everybody wants to feel sorry for them. You can feel sorry for them. Everybody should get that. You're passionate. You're a passionate person. But they're not going to get better unless you actually do something about it. And it's sometimes it's not what they want to do. It's something that you have to do. Hmm. So I'm... I'm uh... Like just the the outside looking in, common sense. Again, I'm not really involved in politics. The business and my family take up a lot of my time. 
Um, but why? My my common sense question is why is there a lot more homelessness in some areas of the valley versus other areas of the valley? What what's the difference? What are they doing different? Or is it just like, is, is it just like an avalanche effect? Is is like a domino effect? Or how how what would you say to that? Well, a lot of it is, is the oversight of what the services are available. The city of India, let's take it as, as an example because I don't want to speak for anybody else. I, I know some of the answers. Um, they push them to certain edges. Um, all the Jail systems here, the probation, public health, hmm. the rescue missions, and a lot of our communities, like our churches, help. And they resonate to where places where people want to go. Miles Park's a good example. That people go out there, they give them food, they, they help them narrow the door, all kinds of other people help. So they'll resonate to where the services are. So you'll see that in certain areas. And then the other one, you look at Banning Beaumont. There's a courthouse there, there's mm -hmm. services there. It's all in places. In, that are available to give them services and at the mm -hmm. same time are lax on punishing them. The city mm -hmm. of India doesn't want to punish our homeless community. Mm -hmm. We want to try and give them help. That's one of the reasons we pay millions of dollars to the rescue mission and you know, so, like so, ABC recovery centers and the other ones out here that we help or support, maybe not financially, but other ways, because we're trying to get the people the help they need, does not the just city push it the other way. Contribute to kill like the rescue mission. Does the city directly contribute, or is oh, it absolutely. more? Okay, so directly. Absolutely. And so do all the other cities. But the problem okay. is, it's it's never enough. So people that have issues with um, some of the homeless in, let's say, Palm Springs or Indian Wells, and that they don't mean to, but they bring them here to give them services. So we end up with a larger group in mm -hmm. these areas here. You have a lot in Palm Springs because you have a lot of pan panhandling and other stuff. And they're a little bit laxer on on some of the rules to trying to force these people down because you're compassionate for people. They're, they're, they're God's children, so you're mm -hmm. looking at them as people. You're not looking at the problem. And I think pushing them from one spot to the other is one of the things that we always do is it gets bad in one spot. You go in there, you clean it up, you push them out. they got nowhere to go. They mm -hmm. just go to the next place. Mm -hmm. Then that becomes a problem, and then it comes back and forth. But the petty, the petty theft, the damages and that they do trying to get alive is costing us more money than it is to try and actually help them. Mm-hmm. So, well said. Any other problems that you would see for the valley? I mean, I'm not just trying to focus uh, on that, but I just think there's opportunities. Yeah, well, there's all kinds. I mean, there's the price of housing. How do we get affordable mm -hmm. housing and put it in the proper places where it doesn't cause bottlenecks or it doesn't cause traffic issues or it doesn't overwhelm the schools or the other stuff that, that are vital to these uh, residents and their parents and their kids and everyone else? So homeless homes itself is 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 next to homelessness mm -hmm. because it's it's one of the things that people do when they don't have the funding to go mm -hmm. and housing are becoming tougher and tougher mm -hmm. for especially the the, the younger generation sure. to actually get out you come out of college you used to be able to make good enough money as an individual now it's a two system family trying to pay it in and sometimes even more than that mm -hmm. and you're still trying to basically make, make ends meet when you mm -hmm. go to the grocery store and stuff so inflation something that you know like we don't have a say in except yeah, what we federal. can do but it affects us all the same because we are the ones that ends up with the issues at hand mm -hmm. and, and speaking to that specific issue of not enough homes part of it too i think and, and i know this from my own experience from building stuff out here is that a lot of times the the added fees that are to be found in California overall is what contributes a large amount to the cost of homes. So I had a friend who left and went to San Antonio, Texas. When he moved there, he was going to try to buy a home by Lennar in, Coach in Coachella. The cost of the home was almost 600000 He went to San Antonio in a nicer area than Coachella and was able to purchase a home for almost half the cost. Like I think it was oh. two ninety, And it's identical home by the same builder. And, and absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, uh, and I'll go back to what we're talking about, homes and homelessness, too. The city of Indio and all our other cities around here in the county are more than happy to give land in, in proper areas where we could build affordable mm -hmm. housing. But once we do that, the state government comes in and says you have to pay prevailing wage. Yeah. And so they either got to cobble a bunch of, of million-dollar grants together to put it together to work, then it would be if, if we're like, you're really serious about homelessness— then the state of California, Gavin Newsom, and the legislators should get out of our way and say, look, if the city of Indio, the city of Coachella, the city of Indian Wells, the county of Riverside, this group wants to give them land and support, it shouldn't kick in prevailing wage. I'm mm -hmm. not saying they should go down to what other people make, but can't we come in between somewhere? Because mm -hmm. a house is costing $500,000 a door, let's say, mm -hmm. to, to do an apartment. That's correct. Where you could buy a mobile home for 
you know, 120,000 120, 120, mm -hmm. to buy them the land. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't we just buy them a movable home? So it kicks in prevailing wage, which is really um, detrimental to building as many houses as possible. Can you, can you explain what prevailing wage is? <laughs> <laughs> prevailing for, wage for our is, listeners, I'm asking. Is, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, too, uh, the cost that you have when you do a government job. They mm -hmm. set rates based on certain classifications along with certain jobs that you might be able to do, like you're a journeyman, you're a carpenter, you're a concrete pour, you're a grader. Um, they get a set fee that's mm -hmm. higher, normally higher by almost two times mm -hmm. what a regular outside contractor would pay. And that's why a lot of people don't want to get involved with it because you have a, let's say you got a good electrician mm -hmm. making $30 an hour, which is good money. Mm -hmm. And now they're making $70, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, working on a city or state project that's getting funded by prevailing wage. It's great for that employee, but when they go back to go to work, mm -hmm. I don't want to work for $30. Mm -hmm. I was getting paid $70 to this, and mm -hmm. the, the jobs aren't consistent. So in prevailing wage, if they could come with a fair rate that would lower the price of houses down, we could build maybe one and a half times or two mm -hmm. times the amount than it's costing us to do it now. And you would still get the same quality of product, and people would still get a good wage but we'd be trying to work towards the problem, which is getting people in homes. Mm -hmm. Cool. So. Well said. Um, speaking to the, flipping it around, like in terms of issues or potential, what would you say for the Cajun Valley, even for Indio, what are the same thing, things that are like promising or like that are just positive that are going on and like lead for a great future? <clears throat> well, the city of Indio, we're in a great place. Our, our residents went off and gave us a one cent sales tax, which we promised w that we would invest in one time projects, mm -hmm. which we are doing. You'll see all the roads being paved. You'll see the landscape. Our city manager, Brian Montgomery, has done a wonderful job. We call him the, the city manager that makes everybody mad because we've got cones everywhere from redoing roads, redoing streets, doing you know infrastructure. We're doing a bridge on 44. We're building new city hall, new this, new that. And it's for the community. When mm -hmm. it's done, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, you know, the city of India got behind. And so when you look at that kind of issues and the money that we're able to bring to the table now is making the difference mm -hmm. in what is, is changing India. Because now the rest of our money is going to hire police officers, making sure that the mediums and that are clean, street sweeping more often. Things that you take for granted is the stuff that we're trying to get going on. And with that, it's bringing in businesses, mm -hmm. it's bringing in churches, it's bringing in houses. We have a little over 4,000 homes being built right now in the city of India, mm. of all sides, wow. from affordable housing off of Jefferson, you see, cool. to high-end homes uh, throughout the valley. A lot of these fill in, like Lennar, Trilogy, mm -hmm. K. Havorian, um, and then you got Lennar, and then now you got the brand new uh, Pulte Project, which is up over by where my district is on the other side of Sun City, which is 1,500 more oh, wow. homes. Uh, right off of Jefferson and 40th. And so they're not building because it's a great deal for, for mm -hmm. Indio. They're building because it's a great deal for everybody. Mm -hmm. They're going to create good jobs, good houses, and the city of Indio is a good bargain for them to be able to provide a house at a good price for people that want to come in. Mm -hmm. So we, what we've done has been able to open up more. And with more houses and the new college that's coming in, College of the Desert and the mm -hmm. stuff downtown, more people want to get involved. So people that wouldn't have spent the money in the city of India or the Coachella Valley are now taking a fresh look at it. Like we have new restaurants coming in, Chick-fil-A, a new In-N-Out Burger, mm -hmm. Dutch Brothers Coffee, we just own a barbecue, Texas Roadhouse. And then you're going to yeah. have a, a wide variety like downtown and then off a of canopy off of Jefferson and 50th. You have, you know, Cork and Fork, Luna Grill. You know, these are coming in to the city of India because of what they see the potential. For sure. They're business people. And another thing I think that's obviously, it's called the city of festivals, right? Right. So I mean, you can't talk about India without talking about Coachella Fest, right? Yeah. Uh, Which is, is a blessing and it can be a challenge, but I think overall it's probably more of a blessing than a challenge. That's another another prime example of of regional work. Mm -hmm. The city of India is the city of festivals. We have the Dade Festival. We have the mm -hmm. Coachella Valley Art and Music Festival. They want to make sure you get art in and they spend <laughs> over a million dollars in art. So trust me, I, I told them the Coachella Fest and the uh, the, the, uh, the um, owners of uh, Golden Voice, uh, Paul Tillet, uh let me know that it is the art festival. And if you go down there, that is one of the highlights is the art that they have there. And you'll see it all mm -hmm. through India if you really, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. look. We put up some new dogs that, that we got from some areas over there like downtown. We got the the ones off of Dr. Carry On. The, the, oh, the, those are nice. I, I drove the by TPS there yesterday. And, and, yeah. and you'll sit throughout the whole city. So the festivals 
make Indio as an international sensation. I mm-hmm. mean, there's you can't go anywhere and people yeah. not know Indio or the Coachella <laughs> Festival, it used art to be, music festival. We were identified by Palm Springs, and yeah. now the Valley's identified as Coachella it, because of Coachella Festival, largely. And, and it is, and so it brings us a lot of money. But without all the other um, cities, without the county. The, mm. their short-term rentals, their hotels, mm. their restaurants, their buses. We would not be able to host it because there's not enough people that have opportunities in India to be able to let people rent their houses. It's not like Augusta National where everything closes down, everybody rents their house to everybody coming in. You know, we still got life to work. Our residents are going to church, they're going to the mm-hmm. restaurants and that. And yeah, it's a little inconvenience to them, but the money that is brought into this valley, into the state, well oversees anything that is a couple for a couple weekends. And you know, we just had um, lacrosse. There was over 15,000 people down there. You didn't hear a wow. word about it. We had the uh, dog show, the Palm Springs Kennel uh, dog show that had over, um, you know, 3,500 dogs and over 10,000 people. You don't hear anything about it. We just had the art, um, Southwest Art Festival. There was another 10,000 people there. And then coming mm-hmm. up in the next two weeks, not only do we have the, the fair coming up, but we all have Major League Soccer. They call it the Cal- wow. Chicago Valley. There's going to be at soccer from grounds? all over at the Polo Grounds. Yes. Wow. For, for two weeks, every major league soccer team in the um, uh, is that privately ML. owned? That place? The... Yes, it's on. It's owned by two groups: the Hagen family, which owns uh, mm-hmm. the Empire Polo Club, and they lease it to Golden Voice, and Golden Voice owns the El Dorado Polo Club. Mm. So that whole area there is is under Golden Voice's control, but it is owned by two separate entities. But you got that. And then right after that, you're, you'll start into the concerts and the music. And then, you know, like I said, you got field hockey. You got things out there all the time. So it's just it's just not music. It's mm-hmm. it's everything. Yeah. Curiosity, um, What? how much money does that bring? And ha- has that been a big contributor on getting out of the deficit? Because you, you mentioned that now it's a... Uh, well, we have a balanced budget. A lot yeah. of it came with good hard work from our staff and city council before me with me and, and into the future will be the ones that are going to make those decisions we we decided to knuckle down and we had a couple lean years we looked at what was important to us that was getting our fiscal house in order knowing that we didn't want to do what happened in 2008 again laying people off and cutting services to our residents and we really got serious about building economic interests and also spending what we had Hmm. And that's really helped us. And uh, with that, uh, spending in the right place has now brought more economic. You know, think of all the grocery stores and all the other stuff that's in here that's coming, you know, Viarta and all the other ones. You know, they don't come if they're not going to make money. So we got them to believe in us because we got our fiscal house in order and we're able to uh, provide them with a facility and a place there that they felt not only is safe, but can grow, grow them economically. And then the word spreads. Hmm. So that that's a lot of it, but the concerts themselves they make the city of Indio anywhere between six and ten million dollars. When you add in TOT tax and 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 ticket tax and other stuff that we have, there are more fees than everything else. But it really spreads the whole control value. It's over two hundred and fifty million, seven hundred million. You know, is high when you talk hmm. about the other concerts that come in. But every hotel that an Indio resident works at is getting more tips more hours nice. more mm-hmm. money that's cool and so it it's a resonating effect so you can't really put money on it except mm-hmm. for uh what it brings overall but it it's it's not the money as much as it's the international fame but yes uh, having the concerts here is a great windfall for cool. from the city of india i agree let me switch to something personal just for a second as mm-hmm. how old are you i'm 61 i think you're doing great so i think <laughs> yeah are you a pickleball champion or what's going on with the no i enjoy the sport very well okay. i mean uh, <laughs> uh my girlfriend diane got me into it at her place in andalusia i was sitting there and a couple of gentlemen a little older than i did asked me if i wanted to play and I just looked at them like no and they, they kind of basically said are you you know chicken or whatever and i'm like <laughs> really so i stand up they were only about five foot five and they were like 100 pounds and i said really and they're like good you're up here here's a paddle there it goes. And so it, it is it's just a great sport. Uh, I played last night with some good friends. I played with a pickleball pro. I played with a lawyer. I played with a financial planner. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter. It's like church. You walk through that door. You all know you love the game. Uh, but, you know, we ran 13 miles yesterday. Wow. Playing pickleball with you just with us. And but you know, you 13 go miles in what, two, three hours? How long is three that? Three hours. Wow. But you go out and you see the people out there. They're young. They're old. 
you know, skinny. It, it's it's just like it's just a group. It has nothing to do with it, and they love the sport, but it's the camaraderie too. Mm-hmm. It's just not only the work that you're doing, uh, being physically active. But it's the people you meet. It's like it's exactly like going to church, kind of, except for you get the the word. But you, when you walk through that door, there's this self of you're with people that you believe. It's like in. a community, and, mm-hmm. and and you'll see ten barbers. And if you lived in that bubble where you'd only see the one that does your hair, you'd see one. But you meet ten, and you meet housewives, and you meet other people. The same there. I mean, you're talking to somebody, and the next thing I know, you find out they were a, a congressman in Texas for 14 years, and they're just sitting there in their shorts, you know, hmm. hitting balls with and you'd never know because they don't care. They're here to play pickleball, like, like, just like church, because you go there and you go there to listen to the word and whoever walks through that door is welcome. Same with pickleball. And that was to make it great. That's and awesome. I, I'm fairly good at it, but there's, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people that can beat me pretty bad. I got, I got a little whipping last <laughs> night, as a matter of fact. So that's cool. Well, what you're doing works. And yeah. so, so physically I had to ask him something about why he's so healthy just to pick on him, but as well, um, you're a man of faith. And mm-hmm. how does your faith help to inform the issue of politics? So looking back towards politics, but I know you're a Christian man, so. Well, it grounds me. I mean, everything I do is based around mm-hmm. my faith. Um, can, I, can I ask you about your faith? When did you become a Christian? Tell, uh, this could inspire somebody to give their life to the Lord. Mm. How, uh, how did you very go about young, that? Mm-hmm. Very young with my grandparents and that. I always had... Um, the Lord in my life. So it's a little bit different. You get away from it as you start to grow kids and that is like everything else. You come out here, you start to work. Got back into it where I was really you know, active, active. You know, I, I was always, you know, I go to church and you go to stuff, but got more active about 20 years ago, hmm. I would say that really came back in and had, where I said, you know, something I need to put my time away from things that aren't as important and get back to what's important. And that's and being good grace with the Lord and, and with the people I meet. And, and it, I met Pastor Nate and some of the gr- greatest people I know out here. Based off that, um, I've been in the golf business. I've been in politics. I've been in nonprofits. And I've met great people through all over. But when it push comes to shove, no matter what happens, besides my family, I can trust the Lord and I can trust the people I met in my churches. So, well said. So how I, has I how And how are churches... Um, uh, for example, Destiny Church does a lot for the community, mm-hmm. and and how important is it to have Destiny Church involved with uh, city officials and servants it, like it, yourself? It, it it's vital, mm-hmm. you know, because it's the heartbeat of our community. It's mm-hmm. all our churches. Destiny Church is a prime example. They're from all over, mm-hmm. and they give back to the community. They're helping out in multiple ways, uh, helping out people that need help helping out families, helping the community through their spending, through other stuff, but more spiritually than it goes through. So whenever we have a problem, and it doesn't matter if it's India or anywhere else, the first thing they do is, as much as they want to say, we got to separate church from state, they call the churches, call mm-hmm. the pastors, call the rabbis, call the, the moms. They call all these individuals to come and talk to them about the issues that are there because they know they are the heartbeat mm-hmm. of the community and they can talk to their their um, all their parishers and that are there and, and all the people that are associated with them and say, look, this is we have an issue. We need to come together as one. And so when you talk about the churches, it's just not only what a spiritual need is, but you know that they're there in the community and they can they can reach out and help, and they love their community. Mm-hmm. And so when you you see a church and and the city of India has fifty eight congregations included in the Buddhist temple, mm-hmm. and uh, good and, and <laughs> religious <we're>, freedom. <laughs> yes, and and when you look at it, they are the ones that you know it's a third of our population mm-hmm. are going to these churches. And so when they come together to help our community, when there's something good, bad, or indifferent, you're, you're talking to a group that's all going to come together, and, mm-hmm. and, and everybody does. So when you see the churches, um, they're just not a place for spiritual. They're a place to make our city a better place to live. Yeah. <clears throat> and let me celebrate the city of India specifically because I know that they always begin – their um, city council meetings with prayer, which I think is a bit unique, probably for the, mm. even the state of California. So they're always they've made it a point wow. to be a Christian cool. city to honor God. Yeah, and, and any congregation, uh, yeah. any church, any group that wants to come speak to us could be a rabbi, whatever. 
everyone's welcome. Mm -hmm. Everyone's welcome to come and say a word. They're always welcome to come and join us at any time. And all they have to do is go to the city website, sign up and say, we'd like to speak Destiny Church. We've had uh, Pastor Bed, Mm -hmm. Pastor Nate. We've had all kinds of them. And they just sign up and they come and and give us the word. To me, that's a a beautiful expression of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really All faith. Everybody's Mm -hmm. welcome in the city of Indio. For sure. Everybody. Nice. That's beautiful. So, um, so the topic of, of our podcast has to do with basically the four F's, right? Faith, family, fitness, finances. Um, in terms of family, can you uh, share a little bit about your family and what are some of the qualities that you've seen that are real good father qualities that if somebody listening to this could take note of and maybe we could all improve mm-hmm. becoming a better father to our children, um, we know that there's a bunch of statistics out there of how children end up as adults when they grow up in a fatherless home. What what would you say to uh, to that? Well, everybody lives a different life, and I was blessed to have three great kids: but a girl and two boys. Great kids, uh, always active, always did. We always had our, our dinners together. You know, we sat down at the table, we brought out the bowls, we all ate, we all talked, we all knew what was going on in our in our family. And and I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with coming back uh, and making sure that what's a priority to you. And it should always be your children. It should always be your your family. It should always be your community and your, and your, and your, your God and your church. But I think nowadays it's important that mm-hmm. as many positive people can be in your life uh, especially your mother and father, because those are the two most influential people in your life. They mm-hmm. are the two that not only brought you into the world, but are going to get you to where you need to be so that you can spread your wings and go on. And the more guidance, the more thought, the more opportunities you have to take that knowledge and know you know, that they're going to be there to help you really eases a lot of, of, of families from the, the burden they have because we all have burdens. Mm-hmm. It could be physical, it could be financial, it could be a lot of things that goes on. But that solid foundation between family with parents and their kids and the family members as a whole is vital to having a good successful mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. life and a good successful childhood so that then you grow up to be a good individual and and that and that's all you can ask and i was very blessed to have three good kids um never got into trouble in terms of drugs or alcohol but a lot of it had to do with just raising them didn't say they didn't cause me some troubles but (laughs) you know something (laughs) they always knew they could come to me they always knew they could come to their mother and that we would be there we might not like what we had to say but they knew that it was coming from us that mm. we only wanted them to be happy, healthy, and make the right decisions. But then in the end, they had to make their own decisions. But, but I could guide them. But why did they feel comfortable? Like what? So I know um, it, it may sound like I'm leading you into like start boasting about yourself, you know, but really you must have done something right mm-hmm. because there's a lot of children that don't go up to their parents when something's going wrong. Or well, when they need to, when they should. And, and, and I think a lot of it's the social ills of, mm-hmm. of social media. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been at uh, local restaurants and that. And just not the kids on the phone, it's the parents on the phone. Mm-hmm. You really got to talk to them. And, and my opportunity to spend time with my kids was vital to me and important to me. But I had good kids and I had good foundation for them. So I was able to, I think, guide them and lead them. I, I don't want to say I was the best father in the world because I, I did a lot of work. I, I did, you know, I'm very dedicated to what I get involved in. But, you know, they always knew that there's going to be food on the table. They have a clean place, safe place to live. They could always have advice uh, from whatever they needed and that they were able to do what they needed to do to make themselves better. And they had to make some mistakes, too. But when they made a mistake, I was there to help them. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there to criticize them, wasn't there to tell them anything wrong, other than, look, this is where we got to go and go on. And I think a lot of parents just don't spend that time with their kids anymore. And I was able to spend as much time as I could, and they turned out to be great kids. So Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate. And if you were to, maybe most of the things you did, 
maybe we, we could ask your kids this question better <laughs> but maybe sometimes people do it second nature because of how they grew up yeah what oh. are some of the takeaways you get you got from your father mm -hmm. or maybe not maybe you're like man if when i become a dad i'll be completely the opposite no <laughs> i got it from my grandfather mm -hmm. and, and and my my parents and everyone i i really had a good childhood i can't ever complain i grew up in farms grew up in golf courses whoever needed me most that's why i worked we worked you were always a part of it. If you're old enough to walk, you're old enough to work. That was the rules. And mm. it just gave me a lot of life experiences. I always felt loved. I always felt uh, that I had the support of my parents. My grandparents were big influences on my life. But it, it does become second nature. To me, doing what I did was because I received that same kind of love and support. And I think a lot of it happens now is, you know, my grandmother was home. My mother was home. They did work a little bit. You know, don't get me wrong. They were very active and very supportive. Farm is a lot of work, trust me. But, you know, you could get away with that. Now both parents are working. They're coming home late. They're, they're doing the best they can. And their kids are at school or they're at daycare after that until 5 or 6 o'clock.